to Bibliophiles Anonymous, episode 47. I'm Denise. And I'm Jess. And tonight we will be talking about the latest book club book over at the Malorian Tavern, which is The Hunger Games. Yay! Yes, we picked this book for book club just because we figured that a lot of people had already read it, and it was a good excuse to reread it, so why not? Uh... But it was funny because I I finished the book. I I had planned to just read the first one and uh, had planned to read it right up until we were recorded. But then I got started and then I couldn't stop. And I finished Mockingjay yesterday. (laughs) Well, I don't own Catching Fire or Mockingjay. So I kind of have to stop the Hunger Games until I can either go to the library or call my friend Paulette and have her borrow her niece's copies and bring them to me again. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, when I got them, when I, I had borrowed the first book, and once I decided that I loved it, I needed to go and get all of them, just because. Well, see, my problem is, my copy of The Hunger Games is paperback. Oh, yeah. And I want them to match, and I can't find Catching Fire and Mockingjay in paperback anywhere. Huh, I wonder if they're out in paperback or not, I don't know. So, you know, when I can get them in paperback, I'll buy them. But until then, I will bum them off someone else. Yeah. No, all of mine are hardcover, so they all match pretty well. But yeah, I actually, I finished reading it last night. So. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. I finished. Yay. <laughs> it, look, it, I have a job now, and that's cutting into my reading time. Yeah, I know. And, you know, I can read on my break, but I read stuff that I have on my phone, and I don't actually take a book with me. So that, you know kind of cut into I was reading the new Chloe Neal book at work on my break instead of you know Hunger Games right well other other than the new Chloe Neal book is there anything else you're reading right now um well I mean my Goodreads says I'm reading like eight things I'm not actively reading that many (laughs) I'm only actively reading at this moment the new Chloe Neal book but I'm probably going to start reading City of Bones because I went to see the movie Friday and I want to read the book and go see it again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, uh, our next episode next week will be a review of uh, City of Bones and because I I went to see it today and you saw it yesterday. We have opinions. Oh boy, do we have opinions. So we were actually just talking about those opinions and uh, that's going to be an interesting episode because just the conversation that we had before we started recording uh, yeah, you're going to want to tune in next week to hear what we have to say because we are super big fans of Cassandra Clare and the Mortal Instruments series. And yes. did we think that this movie lived up to our expectations? Uh, it did. Yeah. You'll have to listen and find out, won't you? <laughs> those, those noises are probably uh, quite indicative. Yeah, so... Uh, like I said, tune in We're next week. Say that. <laughs> yes, and it should, uh, well, it should be interesting and probably amusing. So, <laughs> so we yeah. will save that for next week, and we'll talk about Hunger Games this week. I have to say though, for for the Chloe Neal fans that are listening, I never thought I'd see the day that Ethan Sullivan, Master Vampire of Cadogan House, made a "That's What She Said" joke. <laughs> posted that on Facebook <laughs> and it made me it laugh it me up I'm like really Ethan Sullivan just made a that's what she said joke well wow. you know Merritt is rubbing off on him that was bound to happen eventually I think it's a good thing I like snarky Ethan <laughs> I mean you know this this is actually a pretty good book um you know their battle with the mayor and McKetrick continues of course because you know they're complete buttheads right I was looking for a word I could use that wouldn't need to be censored. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't defend any children listening. Yeah. And, but now, apparently, there are humans rioting in Chicago. Uh-oh. That's not good. Yeah. Oh, and, and Mallory wants Cadogan House to hire her. For what? Liaison? I don't really know. She just, she, she broached the topic with Merritt. She's like, I think I should come work for you guys when I get done with what the shifters are making, putting me through. Okay. That's weird. Yeah. 
Mallory ran that by Ethan, and Ethan's just immediate was like, no. No. <laughs> yeah, no. So, yeah. Mallory's still, you know, with the shifters, and apparently there's a lot more to what the shifters are doing with her than just making her keeping her from using magic. Right. I, they have, I haven't really gotten to the part where they're giving me details about what the shifters are doing. Oh, and, and Cadogan House has been blacklisted by the GP. Not that we didn't see that coming. Oh, please. Yeah. Okay. Big surprise there. Yeah. So, apparently, they're public enemy number one, according to the GP. But the GP is full of a bunch of buttheads. So. Uh, and we knew that, too. Yeah. But so far, it's it's really good. Well, you good. know, living up to all the rest of them. So. Good. That's I'm always, happy. That's always a good thing. Now, this is book six? No, Better eight. Eight. Oh, gosh. Never mind. Okay. Um, I, no, yeah. I didn't realize there were that many of them. I, I remember reading them so fast before. It's like I can't remember which yeah, how many of them were. Was House Roll six or seven? This is this is seven or eight. I don't remember exactly. Oh, anyway, um, to be honest, I just completely immersed myself in Hunger Games stuff this week. I didn't read anything else. I didn't look at anything else. I spent way too much time sneaking and reading time at work. Um, I probably got close to getting in trouble a couple times. <laughs> Came back from my lunch break late because I was stuck in the car reading, and yeah, it was an interesting week. But I couldn't help it, because as soon as I finished... I, I wasn't even planning on reading the whole series. It, then just as soon as I finished Hunger Games, I'm like, all right, where's Catching Fire? Come on, let's go. Let's find it. And Yeah, they suck you in. Oh, my gosh. And so on top of that, I was also reading, turns out, you remember uh, the wonderful website that I keep talking about called Mark Reads? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did uh, Hunger Games, too. So I haven't read along with Hunger Games with him, so I had to go and, and read all of his Hunger Games posts. And then I had to watch his head explode as the events in Catching Fire and Mocking Jay took place. <laughs> he was he was quite uh, quite well impressed is the wrong word to use, but he was quite uh, appalled, excited, terrified, all of the big superlative words uh, yeah. about everything that was going on with good reason. But, yeah, I was I was not planning on doing that. And, of course, after I finished Catching Fire, it had been a while since I had read it, and I had to immediately jump onto IMDb and look at all of the Catching Fire movie stuff that's been yeah. coming out. Because uh, the movie comes out in November, I think. And I had seen, like, some of the promo pictures of some of the, the, the new tributes that are going to be in there, and I had seen both of the trailers that are out, but it had been so long since I'd read the book that all I saw were kind of, you know, images. Okay, well, that looks nice, but I couldn't relate it to anything because yeah. I couldn't remember. So I had to go back and look at all of that stuff, and now I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Why is it not November already? Because <laughs> well, seriously, it now, looks really good. I remember um, this was after I had read all of them. You know, I've mentioned several times that I watch that British Girls vlogs on YouTube. Right. Caters 1-7. Well, there was one of them, one of the, her earlier vlogs, um, a bunch of people, she had asked for book recommendations, and apparently a bunch of people recommended The Hunger Games. Uh-huh. So she got them, and when she finished the last one, she was laying in the dining room floor, and she threw it across the room. <laughs> she, like, slid it across the floor. And I kind of agree, because the way it ends, I really, really, really want her to write a sequel series yeah I, I i understand but at the same time the ending was kind of perfect in a way because i was glad that it wasn't just a happy ever after yeah well because with with everything that those people have been through i don't care how many years go by you're still going to be affected right well i'm not and i'm not saying that we should get a happily ever after but, uh, there, I feel like there's more story there. Yeah. And I want it. I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, uh, figure it out for yourself endings. Well, I mean, we, we, we learn a lot of the main stuff. We know that, uh, well, Katniss and Peta got married and had kids. And that Gail was working somewhere in District 2 with the defense and 
army and stuff. And I think her mother ended up in District 4 running a hospital. I mean, that was about all they gave us, really, but... Well, I think actually what I want is more actually probably a prequel, because I want to know more about what happened with District 13. That would be fun. Now, that idea I could get behind. You know, I would like to know just exactly, you know, what was going on in District 13. Or maybe not necessarily a prequel, but more like a like a parallel series. Yeah. Like what these people were doing in District 13 when all this was going on with Katniss. Oh, that would be interesting, too. And also, maybe... Well, this would be more along the lines of a prequel. But the first rebellion... Yeah. When the districts were formed and the Hunger Games were... Established. Yeah. Well, that would be interesting, too. Yeah. I mean, we get a little bit of the history, but none of the really gritty details. There's a lot of directions she could go if she wanted to write an offshoot series. Yeah. And I think she should. Well, it, it's something that the fans would probably eat up, so... Well, that's something just to like think I... about. I, I still think J.K. Rowling should write more Hogwarts books. They wouldn't be Harry Potter, but they could be, you know, Harry Potter's kids. Or the Marauders. Yes! How, how awesome would that be if she wrote a, a Marauders series? That would be fantastically amazing. Yeah. It's probably not going to happen, though. No. But, anyway, Hunger Games. We're really yeah. getting off track. Okay, so, Hunger Games. Uh, let's see. The book opens up, and we meet our main character, our heroine, Katniss Everdeen. And you you learn a couple of things about her right away. Number one, she's kind of the, the breadwinner of her family, because her father was killed in a mining accident, and her mother hasn't really been right since. So she has been working now. She's only 16. Yes. And she has been going out and hunting illegally to try and uh, both put food on their table and also to earn money to buy other things that they need. Or trade for other things that they need. Right. And right away, I think from the very first few pages, I really liked her. Yeah. She's just one of those characters that, that sticks with you. She's so tough and in some ways it I mean it's hard for me to even fathom what she had to go through and this is even before she went into the Hunger Games but just having to take care of her family and you know, knowing basically that at any day she could be arrested except for the fact that the peacekeepers which is basically like the police force were some of her best customers Yeah. but at any time she could lose everything and she's still right out there trying to take care of her family, especially her sister, Prim. And as she's out hunting, you hear a little bit about where they live and a little bit more about their lives. Yeah, I, I and she was part of, you know, that wave of protagonists that came along and made archery cool again. Oh, yeah. Well, she was she she was one of the ones that made archery cool again. Then she was just also another one of those really really strong female characters that for the longest time you didn't have a lot Without of them. Without them being you know overbearing and snotty and no, she's I mean she's not she's difficult at times, but you completely understand why. Yeah, I mean, she's really going through a lot, but she. They live in District 12, which is a part of this country called Pan Am. And Pan Am is which actually is... basically the United States. Right. After a whole bunch of really bad end-of-the-world type stuff has happened to it. And District 12 is kind of in our neck of the woods. Sort of, yeah. It's um, A lot of people are try tried to figure out. I've seen, I've been looking for a lot of maps where well, people have been trying now there there isn't an official map of what Pan Am looks like but there's a lot of maps where people have been trying to figure it out well it says district 12 is in a region formerly known as Appalachia and you know 
granted, where I live in Alabama just barely qualifies because we're kind of the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Right. But you know it's, you know, in the, from, you know, kind of North Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, in the Carolinas, in Virginia, because they're coal miners. Right. And that's kind of where the coal seams run. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the general sort of vicinity of District 12. Right. And actually, um, when we took a road trip, uh, just going up towards the mountains, uh, you can drive by the little abandoned town area that they used to film part of District 12. That's neat. And there's a sign up saying that this is where the Hunger Games was. You can see the bakery where, where PETA's family works. So, yeah. that was kind of cool. But, anyway. Um, so, yeah. District 12 is, is here. I think the capital is supposed to be somewhere around Denver. Yeah. Uh, but, other than that, we only have kind of the barest of structures as to where everything is. I think District 11 is probably somewhere, like, Midwest. Because that's where they do a lot of the agriculture yeah. And I'm just thinking of when I had to drive across Kansas and through the miles and miles and miles and miles of cornfields. Um, yeah. So it's probably somewhere that direction. Well, I haven't been quite that far, but I did go, you know, through Arkansas and into Oklahoma, so. Yeah. So I probably probably somewhere in that part. Although Oklahoma part is covered in lavender. Ooh, I bet that's pretty. It was. We started to stop and pick some, but we were on a toll road and... There wasn't really a nice, safe place to pull over. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, 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 that's the one thing that bugged me about the books is that I didn't have a map. A map would have been helpful because we had, you had to kind of piece together a lot. And, yeah. and I mean, and that's, that's fine. I mean, we can make it work. But in any case, uh, you find out that... Uh, this event called the Hunger Games is getting ready to take place. And the Hunger Games is happens every year, and it is a way for the Capitol to demonstrate their control over the districts. And they gather up all of the children from age 12 to age 18, and they pick one boy and one girl, and it's just random slips of paper inside a big bowl, and they pick one out, and that's who goes. So it's all up to chance. And they round up all of these children, so there would be 24 of them in all, and put them in some sort of arena, which can look like pretty much anything. Mm-hmm. And it's a fight to the death, and whoever is left standing is the winner. Because that's not barbaric at all. No, not even a little bit. It's perfectly civilized. So, see, that's that's the thing. When I read these, the first time I'm thinking these are are young adult books. Yeah, they don't come across as young adult hardly at all. Except that the characters are teenagers. And that's it. And I, it kills me that nowadays any book that the character is a teenager is automatically labeled young adult when that's not necessarily true. Because they are incredibly violent. Yeah. I mean, you've got, tw- what, 12 to 18 year olds mm-hmm. killing mm-hmm. each other? Basically by any means necessary. I mean, it's if you it's kill or be killed. Yeah. And I mean, that's it's... the only options. There's, there's no... I don't want to do this. Let me go home. Yeah, you don't. You don't have a choice. And even if you try to abstain from fighting, they're gonna figure out a way to make you do it. And it's as much a psychological challenge as it is a physical one. Mm-hmm. And the people of the districts, especially District Twelve, which is an extremely poor district, they very rarely have enough food, and they've only ever had one victor in 74 years of doing the Hunger Games. And we'll talk Haymitch. about him in a minute. But, yes, we love Haymitch. Haymitch is a really interesting character. Probably one of my favorites in the series. Also, I love the fact that Woody Harrelson played him in the movie. And he was perfect. Yeah, I th- when I first saw that, I was like, they could not have gotten anybody better. Yes. 
basically, I mean, I'm just going to come out and say it. We're going to make a lot of comparisons to the movie because the movie did just come out, like, was it, last year? Yeah. Uh, and I will flat out say that it is probably the best book-to-movie adaptation I've ever seen as far as being completely faithful to the, you know, subject matter. Yeah. It was a really good I one. mean, seriously. And I had forgotten just how good, because I've actually seen the movie a lot more recently than I've read the book. And when I was reading through it, I was I was thinking that maybe it wasn't as good as what I was thinking that it was. Maybe because it had been so long, I had kind of forgotten a whole bunch of things. But almost every single main thing that happens in the book is in the movie. I mean, some of the detail is left out, and they actually added a lot more, because with the book being in, in first person, in Katniss's point of view, you're limited to only seeing what she's seeing at the time. Right. Whereas the movie was able to open it up a little bit, and you got to see more of what was going on in the Capitol. I loved the part where you got to see the game makers and yeah. what they were doing. It was just, it kind of gave this whole other layer of of stuff, and it was really, really cool. So it was it was a case of a movie changing things, but doing it in a way that added to what we had instead of detracting from it. Right. So pay attention. Anybody else out there who is making book-to-movie adaptations, if you want a lesson on how to do it right, watch The Hunger Games. Yeah, and read the book. So that you can compare the two. Yes, because it was pretty darn perfect anyway so you have this this hunger games thing and katniss has a friend named gail who was boy by the way not a girl and i am gail by the way huh i was always team gail uh, i kind of went back and forth I actually did. for a while towards the, the end i didn't want her to end up with either one of them because they were both acting just wrong but anyway well yeah they were but you know I really, book and movie, I just did not like Peter. I don't know why, but I didn't. That is the weirdest thing. It's like, especially in, in the first book, it's like, how can you not like Peter? It's like not liking a puppy. Because I did, I don't know. I just, hmm, he just got under my skin for some reason. I don't know. She was... That for me, I was I was never like on one of the teams. I I assumed that she would probably end up with one of them, and Tim, it didn't really matter because whoever ended up with whoever, it was going to be just a very interesting relationship. Just because by the end of everything, they are just they're such damaged people yeah. that oh gosh, I can't even I can't even imagine going through everything that they went through and then having to try and build your life back up. Yeah. You know, and so it would just be it it would be it would be so difficult and you would need somebody who understood and who had been through at least part of it with you. Yeah. Cuz otherwise it just it would not work. <laughs> but we're jumping ahead of I ourselves. I mean, I agree. Yeah. So, basically, too, you're, you can put your name in extra times to get extra rations for your family. Right. And doesn't it, doesn't, doesn't it add one every year anyway? Yes, you get, like, the first year you go in when you're 12, you have one slip of paper with your name on it. And then when you go in the next year at 13, you have two slips, and on and on until you're at 18, and then you would have... 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, seven slips in the bowl, theoretically. And I think the reason for that is because they, they tried to kind of weigh the odds into getting some of the older children or teenagers. Uh, How nice of them. Well, it to, I guess to make it more fair because, you know, they would be bigger and stronger or whatever. But with this... Make it entertaining because they're bigger and stronger. Yeah. Because that is the whole point of the Hunger Games. It's to entertain. <laughs> it's, I mean, basically, this is like reality TV gone bad. Very, 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 very bad. bad. <laughs> and, and, it's like, it, it is, and it's not like reality TV now where you can just turn it off. 
No, it's required viewing for, for a lot of the people. Yeah. Either in their homes or they have big screens in, like, big, you know, public areas where you can go and watch with your city. Uh, I mean, basically, it's treated as though it's this big holiday when they're forced to watch these children fight to the death. It's so messed up. It really is. But... Like you were yeah. saying, you can put your name in extra times in order to get some extra food for your family. So Katniss's name is actually in there quite a bit more times than her age would normally have. And Gail's is in there a whole bunch more because you could put your name in extra for yourself, but then also put it in for your family. And he has, like, for each member of your family, and he has, like, four siblings or something like that. Yeah, so, he, you know, you get one extra for yourself and then one extra for each member of your family. So, you know, Katniss could put hers in an extra three times every year. And Gail had, like, four siblings and parents and all that stuff. So his his name was in there quite a lot. Of course, naturally, he's not the one that gets picked. Right. But, yeah, we get the, we, they all gather in the, the square. You get to see Hamish for the first time. And he's falling down drunk. As always. As usual. And we also get to see Effie Trinket, who is the Capitals representative and kind of the chaperone almost for the tributes from District 12. And she gets to pick out the... out of the bowl. Pick the, the people. And so she reaches in to pick out the girl... And it's not Katniss, which, when you're reading it, you expect it to be Katniss. Because this is her story talking about, assuming that she's going to the Hunger Games, you expected her to go. But it's not her. It's her baby sister. Primrose. Yes. Who is 12 years old. This is her first year in there. And her name once. Yeah, her name is only in there once. And so, she shouldn't have been picked. But... Somehow she was. Of course, everybody is devastated because nobody likes to see the 12-year-olds go because it just seems so unfair. And Katniss immediately jumps up and volunteers to go in her place. Which, I don't know that I would be able to do that. Yeah, I, I would like to say that I could, but that's just, that's so terrifying. But I don't have any younger siblings, so... I can't really wrap my head around yeah. that kind of relationship. Well, the only thing that I could equate it to would be like if it was like one of like one of my kids that had to go through this and would I do it in their place? And that and yeah, I would. But it's it's just that is one strong strong person. Yeah. Knowing knowing what you know about what you're signing up for and knowing that you don't have to do it. Because there was another 12-year-old that was called up in District 11, and nobody volunteered for her. Yeah, rude. Yeah, and, you know, it would be it would be devastating if Prim left, but I don't think anybody would have blamed Katniss for not volunteering. Right. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, why didn't you take her place, why didn't you take her place? It would have, they would have commiserated with her as far as losing her sister basically but prim is at this point at least she's very delicate and she's she always seems a lot younger than her years which when she does start growing up more and she becomes so stronger in later books when she's training to be a doctor and everything else it almost seems shocking because even though she's young she seems so much younger in this first book yeah that it's hard to even picture her being someone who has that much responsibility in in the later books but so Katniss is chosen and then the boy who gets chosen it's not Gail it's Peta who is the son of a baker in the in the merchants area of the of district 12 yeah and Katniss knows him not just because they were in school together, but because uh, he kind of 
saved her life indirectly in a way. Yeah. With the bread. Yeah, she was starving and he in, in, intentionally burned some bread so that he could give it to her. Right. He, he, he dropped it in the fire so that his mother would tell him to go feed it to their pigs that were outside. But instead, he threw it to Katniss. And the bread was a little bit burned, but it was fine. And that bread kind of... It was, I think it was right after her father had died, and she was trying to take care of her family and wasn't doing very well because she was still pretty young. I mean, she was only, I think, 12 or 13 when that happened. Yeah. And so it was like that that bread kind of gave her hope in a way because it was, it was a gesture and then just kind of realizing that she could find a way to make this work. Well, she said right after he gave her the bread, she saw the dandelion and that told her how she could feed her family. Yeah. She could hunt. She could do the hunting and gathering thing. Like her father did. Yeah. She could kind of take his place in a way. But... So Kat- and she, hmm? she sort of resented Peta for it. For it. Well, she's she's a very independent person. She didn't like owing him. Well, yeah, and there's several instances where she says that not just about him, but about other people as well. And that that was one of her, one of her character flaws because even though she has like next to nothing, she's very proud of yeah. what she's been able to do, and she knows that she's good at taking care of her family and she does take a certain amount of pride in that so anytime that somebody does help her in that way she kind of feels funny about it yeah and she wants to repay it and doesn't know how and yeah it just it kind of eats at her and she finally she finally tells Peta eventually that it seems like she's never going to finish owing him stop owing him for that bread yeah but they, they get a, a chance to say goodbye to their family and their friends. And she kind of gives Prim some instructions never to sign up for the extra food, put your name in more times, and to use the goat that they have to sell like milk and cheese and that sort of thing. She tells her mom that her mom needs to, you know, step up and start looking after things again because... You know, Katniss isn't going to be there anymore. But, well, they left this out in the movie, but she also gets a visit from Peta's father, who promises to look after her sister. And can I just say, I kind of wanted to slap Peta's mom when Peta was talking about what his mom said when she came to see him. Yeah. I mean, seriously, you're getting ready to send your child off to, you know... Almost certain death. Almost certain death. And basically saying, well, it's a good thing somebody from our district's going to win, and guess what? It's not going to be you. <laughs> yeah. That girl's a survivor. Okay. Thanks for the ringing endorsement, Mom. <laughs> Yo, I was just like, oh, my God. Well, you kind of get the feeling that she's not a really nice person anyway. Yeah. But... um. You also get a visit. She also gets a visit visit from Madge, who is the mayor's daughter, who gives her this pin that has a picture of a bird on it, and it's a mockingjay. And that doesn't really become important in this book, except that she kind of uses it as a good luck charm in a way, because it's her symbol that she brings with her from her district. Yeah. But it becomes vastly important later on. <laughs> Yes. But then, of course, Gail comes and says goodbye to her and, again, promises that he won't let her family starve. That he'll continue to bring them food and and help them the same way that he's always helped them with her, even if she's not going to be there. So Katniss can kind of leave, I guess, feeling like all of her loose ends are tied up as best as she can. Yeah. Because she does not expect to come back. Which would make, you know, if she didn't, that would make the next two books really kind of sad, but, um... Yeah, it'd be kind of hard to have those. Which, I mean, that does make it seem like you know that she's going to make it. But at the same time, it's it never ever seemed, it never felt like it was a sure thing when you're reading it. 
No. I mean, logically, you're like, well, they're not going to kill her off because they have all these other books that to do. But, man, it didn't feel like that when you were in the middle of all of it and you're just waiting for something else to happen and something else to go wrong. I mean, just the way that Suzanne Collins can write just these action-filled, tension-filled scenes that just keep going over and over. There were several times on the Mark Reed's website where he just reads it like one chapter a day where he thought that he was just going to explode because she's also really good at writing cliffhangers at the end of every single chapter. <laughs> yeah. Where you're just like, what just happened? Gotta keep reading. Okay, we're reading, we're reading, and then we get to the end of the chapter. What just happened? Oh my gosh, keep reading. I mean, that's how I read these books so fast is because you that's literally... Why you that's why they suck you in. You cannot put them down. You get to a certain point where it's just non-stop just this build up of tension and dread and you want to figure out you you're hoping that they can get through it and you don't know how it's going to work and you just have to see how it all comes together and she's just she's so good at that and they they get on a train as they're going up to the capital and while they're on the train they're kind of fattened up in a way, <laughs> they're they're given like all this food and pampering, and they're supposed to, as they're in on the train, and then as they're in the training center in the capital, they're they're supposed to learn from their mentor, which all they have is Hamish, but they're supposed to. <laughs> I know. And that's got to be a bad feeling. I mean, I like Hamish, don't get me wrong, but knowing that the one person who is not only responsible for overseeing your training and helping you develop strategy, oh, and also coordinating things with your sponsors so that you get a little bit of help while you're in the re arena, yeah, that guy is a raving drunk. Yep. Good luck with that. <laughs> it, Real. I mean, that's that's not comforting at all. But... And the fact that he, he's kind of manipulative. Kind of. Okay, he's really manipulative. Incredibly so. I mean, not in a bad way necessarily, but he's he's trying to play with, with certain angles and trying to figure out different ways. Because he's been there and he's done this and he's mentored, I mean, every other tr team of tributes that have gone since he won. I mean, that's part of what they do. And actually, hang on, he... He won during the first quarter quell. Yeah. So that was the 25th Hunger Games, and now it's the 74th. So he's been doing this for a long time. And I probably drink, too. Yeah. I mean, he's basically been trying to help kids survive and basically sending them to their deaths for, what is that, like 50 years? Almost 50 years? Yeah. Yeah. 49 years. So, yeah, I would probably drink heavily, too. And, so you, again, you can't blame him, but at the same time, it's not helpful right now. <laughs> uh, no, it's like, could you kindly knock it off? Yeah, well, he kind of does. Sort of. He attempts to, to mitigate. Yeah. Well, because he says, he says he has a couple of fighters this year. And kind of feels a little bit hopeful for them. But... They, they don't have a lot going for them, to be completely honest. I mean, they're not as strong as what some of the the tributes are going to be, especially the ones from, like, Districts 1 and 2, because they're what they call career tributes, where they kind of train for this, even though they're yeah. not technically supposed to. But they train all of their kids to be ready to be chosen for the Hunger Games, and then usually the strongest will go up and volunteer and they always do this, and so that's why there's almost always a victor from Districts 1 or 2, and they're the closest to the capital. They're kind of the most in favor with the capital, and so their kids are always very strong and huge and very well-fed, which is also something that turns out to be a little bit of a liability, and Katniss comes up with it. She's like, they don't know what it's like to go without they don't, they don't know how to be hungry. Yeah. And so what seems like a really big strength actually turns out working against them eventually. 
So, let's see. It all blends together after you read, like, all three of them on a really, like, quickly. Um, I love when they get there and they start their training and they have to be scored. Mm Mm-hmm. I love what Katniss does. Oh, my gosh. I know know what you're getting ready to talk about. But before we get to that part, we have to talk about my... The t- my tie for my favorite character, along with Haymitch. Cinna? Cinna. I love Cinna. I love Cinna. So, like we said, this is like a big festival. It's a big party. Everybody in the capital is celebrating, and these, these tributes kind of become like these heroes. And It's kind of like the Olympics. Yeah, but only... It's like, like the opening ceremony. A lot more way. violent. And yes. Yeah. So... They they bring in all of the, the tributes, and, like, Katniss talks about how they're, like, trying to remove, like, every single piece of body hair except for what's on her head. And they're trying to clean her up and make sure that she's, like, perfect for when her stylist comes in. And we said his name is Cinna, who was surprisingly well portrayed by Lenny Kravitz in the movie. Yes, I was I was very anxious about that one, but he did really good. He, he was did. so good. I mean, I couldn't now after seeing it, I can't think of anybody else who would have who would have done it and and been anywhere near as good. So that was that was perfect. But anyway, um it's his job to design what they're going to look like for what is basically the opening ceremonies. And Katniss was kind of dreading this part because they kind of try and play up what you, what your district is known for and what, what they do. So she said that the people from 12, they're always dressed up like in funny, stupid coal miner outfits with lamps on their heads and that kind of thing. So she was kind of not looking forward to this part. But then Cinna was like, you know, I think we're not going to go with that route. We're going to focus instead on what coal is used for. And so they end up in these, these uh, kind of form fitting black outfits with these capes and the capes, when they, when they go out and they're in these like chariots, the capes are on fire. Yes. And Oh my gosh, was this so amazing to see in the movie? Oh, I, I keep saying that and I just, I can't stop. Um, but Gosh, this movie was so well. I need to re- I need to watch it again. Um, I do too. Let <laughs> me do that. Uh, yeah. Um, but it was just it was the way that the the fire worked and it was it was amazing and they immediately draw the attention of everybody. Um, just the way that they they look with this fire and they look very mysterious and otherworldly. They're holding hands. And they come out holding hands. Yes. Like they are kind of presenting a unified front, which is not something that you usually see from any of the other districts because they're already kind of seeing each other as being adversaries. So yeah, I, I love Cinna. I love his ideas for trying to make them stand out and showing that district 12 is important because I don't think prior to this, that as but in the games that District Twelve was really given any kind of thought. Yeah. You know, Senna actually kind of becomes Katniss's friend, which is something she doesn't have a lot of once she gets cap gets to the capital because she's away from Gale. Yeah. And she is eternally frustrated with Peta. And hey Mitch. And everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, if we could have just given Katniss a bow and arrows and let her go crazy, she could have solved a lot of problems. But, uh, they start their training, and they have the option to train separately or together. And since they're doing this whole shtick where they have to stay together and and show that they're, you know, united, blah, 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 they opt to train together, except for their private audience with the game makers. Right. And by the time District 12 gets in there, the game makers are more focused on their food than they are the tributes. Well, they're tired because 12 is the last one to come through and, you know, it's it's been a long day and they, all they have to do is sit there and watch and that's such a big deal. I mean, I mean it's nothing like actually fighting for your life, but it's yeah. so tiring. 
So, since they won't pay attention to her, Katniss decides to make them pay attention. <laughs> yes. And she takes her bow and arrows, which is her strength. Which during the open training, they decided that she wouldn't make a big deal out of that. She would, she would save it for the private thing. And uh, they're basically made, having a fuss over this p- roasted pig. So Katniss shoots the apple out of its mouth. <laughs> and causes one of the game makers to fall in a punch bowl. And uh, she was afraid that she had completely screwed up. That they were going to give her like a one. And the, they're ranked on a scale of what was one to twelve. Twelve being the highest. Yes. And Katniss ends up with an eleven, which surprises the heck out of everybody. Yeah, everybody's just like, "You really just screwed the pooch, basically." Yeah. No, she got an eleven. Mm-hmm. Which made the career tributes hate her immediately. Yeah. Basically, it painted a, a huge target on her back. Yeah. I mean, she would have been better off with, like, a 9. Yeah. But because she got an 11, which was the highest of any tribute, it was like, mm, she's got to go. Yeah. But, um, let's see, after that, um, is there interviews? Yeah. Or, or are we out of order? Oh, well. But they have their interviews, which is basically a big live television show with host Caesar Flickerman, who also was very well portrayed in the movie. Stanley Tucci. Oh, is... he was so <laughs> funny. How do you show like every single tooth in your mouth when you smile? I don't know how he does it. I love him anyway. I've seen he's in Easy A and he's in Burlesque and he's I just I love him. He's awesome. He was wonderful. He's fabulous. Yeah. And so he had to he interviews each of the tributes and uh, Katniss is terrified because He's, she doesn't think that there's any way to make people like her. She's very abrupt. She's under a little bit of pressure. And she's just not good at trying to impress people. And so Cinna, of course, is his wonderful self and tells her not to worry about it. Just try and pretend like you're just talking to me you're just you're talking to a friend you're talking to me and he'll he'll help you because you know be honest and be honest because you know he's he's, caesar's trying to make a good show here he's going to help you get through it he's not going to try and make you look bad because that would make him look bad too and so i love when she went out there that uh when he asked her what she liked best and she said the lambs do yeah (laughs) and she does a really good job in the interview and or it, it's good for her because she's she kind of comes off as being a little bit cute and silly which is not what you would usually describe her as at all but yeah. she's kind of like that's good enough at least they don't hate me and then Peter gets up there I kind of wanted to hit him and then you just need to hold on to something because as they're going through and they're talking. I mean, he's a natural with people. And the crowd loves him. Caesar loves talking to him. I love the way that they did this in the movie where they were, like, smelling each other. It was hilarious. Yeah. But... He, he drops a big bombshell. He, a major bombshell. Because Caesar talks about, you know, well, do you have a girl waiting back home? And Peter's like, no, no, I don't. And Caesar kind of, like, prods him at him, like, oh, come on, come on, there's there's got to be, you know, a nice-looking young man like you, come on. And he's like, well, okay, there's this one girl that I, I really, really like, but I don't think she really knew who I was until the reaping. And Caesar's like, oh, well, you know, that's, when if you go back and you win, then it's, it's going to be great, and she's going to, you know, fall all over you, right? And Peter's like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. Because she kind of came here with me. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Katniss is like, say what? <laughs> yeah, she. you know she wanted to hit him. God smacked. Well, she does hit him later. Yeah. But She's just like, what? And, and she thinks, uh, 
I mean, for the longest time, she believes that it's just an act. Yeah. She, she doesn't realize that Pete is telling the truth. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess that kind of part of it was because Hamish kind of not pushed her into thinking that, but he did give her, tried to help, help calm her down because she's like, he made me look like an idiot. And it's like, no, he made you memorable. Because now everybody out there is talking about the two of you and everybody is especially talking about you because he was talking about you. Right. And before you were, you know, kind of a cute girl, but you were forgettable. And now, now nobody's going to forget this story at all. Yeah, it, it probably got her more sponsors. Yeah. Because, you know, that, that gave them a story, something for people to latch on to. Right. But because Hey Mitch was like, oh, he gave you an advantage, it, it kind of enforced her belief that they got together and made this up. Right. When they didn't, they got together and Hey Mitch, I think it went more like they got together and Hey Mitch was like, look, I know you're in love with her. Let's play that. Yeah. But you can you can see how Katniss misunderstood. It, it's yeah. And besides that, she's under a lot of stress and probably doesn't want to think that way at the moment. But you know, still, I would have I would have probably hit him too. Yeah. But that, yeah. That very very public way of dropping that bombshell. Yeah. It was very very true. But anyway, so they, after this, it's pretty much, let's get ready to go into the arena. And they get a a tracker, it's called a tracker, it's kind of injected into them so that they'll be able to find them in the arena. And they basically are put into these tubes, and then the tube rises and a door above you opens and you're just out in the, what looks like the open, but you're actually inside something. And... Then there's a countdown, and off you go. And yeah, you have to wait, though, because if you try to go early, then, you know, you'll die. Yeah, because there's mines around the, the podiums where all the tributes stand. And Hamish told them to ignore... There's this big thing, it's called the cornucopia, that's out in the middle of this big field, and all the tributes surround it. And the cornucopia is filled with weapons and supplies and oftentimes food and water and that sort of thing. But he said, ignore the cornucopia. Get as far away from the fighting as possible because the first day is usually a bloodbath. Because people are trying to get supplies and get other stuff. So get away from there and find water. So Katniss goes to do that, but then she kind of catches Peter like trying to shake his head at her. And she's kind of like, what is he doing? And she kind of loses a split second to go and do anything because she's kind of undecided because she sees that there's a bow and arrow up there and she knows that they put that in there for her but she also knows that it would be next to impossible for her to get it at this point so she takes off running she ends up with a bright orange backpack a plastic tarp and a knife because oh yeah one of the tributes is throwing knives like there's no tomorrow So it gets stuck in the backpack, and she ends up with it. And spends pretty much most of the first day walking around, or actually for the first little bit, walking around and trying to find water, which she can't find. Now, she knows that there's a big lake over by the cornucopia, but that's sure to be where the careers are all hanging out, which means they would kill her on sight. Yeah. And this is one part that was left out of the movie a little bit, which I was not uh, upset about. Because it involves her wandering around um, and slowly dehydrating to death. Yeah. Because she can't find water. And eventually she does. But not before you get a lot of really bad like details as to what it feels like to dehydrate. And I just hope I never do because, oh, it sounds bad. Yeah. It's not a pleasant way to die. No, it doesn't sound like it. But, yeah, she keeps saying that, you know, Hamish could send me water. He could do something. He could get my sponsors to send me water. 
And then she starts realizing, you know, well, he wouldn't do that if he knows that I'm close to finding it. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep going. Right. And and she learns, and this, this happens several more times over the course of the book, how to interpret when he does and doesn't send her things. Because she says at one point that Peta just sees Hey Mitch's gift, but she sees the strings attached to it. Mm-hmm. Which is true. You know, he has ulterior motives when he sends her stuff. That's true. Especially once, you know, she meets up with Peta. Yeah, at first, Peta is teamed up with the careers. Which surprises everybody. And... Yeah. She feels betrayed. Well, uh, obviously. Uh, who wouldn't? Yeah. But you, um, she's been spending a lot of her time hiding out in the trees, basically. And yep. she's in one of these trees when she sees them. And then at one point they're chasing her and she ends up climbing the trees. But because she's so much smaller than they are, she's able to go up quite quite high. And uh, they have the bow and arrows, though. And they try and shoot her out of the tree, but they're not very good at it. So all they do is basically give her an arrow. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. uh, and this part, too, I thought was really funny because she was kind of playing it to the cameras a little bit. Which is is not necessarily something you'd expect from her. But when, when they find her up in the tree and she's like, So how's it going with you? <laughs> yeah. You know, that part I thought was was really cute, but she's, um, they, they basically decide that they're going to wait her out because she's stuck in the tree. She can't get down without them knowing it. And eventually she has to come down. So they're just going to wait for her to come down. Now it's the tributes from districts one and two and PETA. And so while she's sitting up there in the tree, she's trying to figure out what the heck do I do now? This is not a good thing. Oh, wait a second. Now before this is the fire, isn't it? Did we see this before? This? Yeah, yeah, yes. It, yeah. Before this is the fire, the the game makers basically set everything on fire. Well, yeah, because she said that they're trying to flush out some of the tributes to make them kind of end up in the right area. Because if you just watch a whole bunch of people that are just kind of hiking through the woods, that's boring. So they need to speed things up a little bit. So they're able to manipulate the arena to do whatever they want it to do and one thing that they do is a big wall of fire and then like a whole bunch of like fireballs uh so her leg ends up getting really really badly burned and she also kind of has issues with smoke inhalation and she's kind of a mess when she's sitting up in that tree and i really don't know how she climbed it in the first place except that i guess adrenaline was kicked in pretty heavy yeah but also smoke inhalation, not a very pleasant way to die. No, no. But so she's up there, and the other tributes are below her and waiting for her to come down. And while she's sitting up there, she notices that in another tree next to her is Rue, who is the 12 year old tribute from uh, District 11. And when they were going through the training and stuff, Rue kind of followed along behind Katniss a little bit. And several times Katniss says that Rue just reminded her of Prim. Not that they looked anything alike, but just the vulnerability and the sweetness and that that whole side of, of the two little girls. And just being the same age, too, and that kind of made her think what... Prim's experience would have been like had Prim gone and she was just that that whole you know kind of correlation between Rue and, and Prim just really made Katniss want to latch onto Rue even yeah. though eventually they all have to end up being enemies but Rue kind of points out that oh look in the tree that you're in there's that you see that thing right up there yeah that's no it's not like another animal or something that's a big fat wasp's nest and oh yeah guess what those aren't actually wasps they're tractor tractor. jackers oh my god as somebody who has a bee phobia this is not a good scene (laughs) i don't have a particular problem with them but i do have a mom my mom is like severely allergic 
st stinging insects. So, yeah. Oh, man. Basically, the tracker jackers, they are genetically enhanced wasps that when they sting, they have venom that produces severe hallucinations and swelling and will kill you if you get stung by enough of them and can basically drive you insane if you don't die. Uh, but they're also part of their thing is that they will keep tracking the person who attacked them. Right. So even if, like, they sting you, that's not it, because they're going to continue to sting you and to chase you. Until you die. Until they, yeah, or they do, I guess, okay. if you manage to spot it. But, yeah, no thank you. <laughs> this is a horrifying concept. <laughs> but... Well, no, even without a bee phobia, it's kind of creepy. Oh, God. And it was so horrible the first time I went to see the movie, because... As soon as she's up the tree and you know that the careers are at the bottom of the tree, you know it's coming. Yeah. And you're, I mean, I was such like a this is little knot of anxiety the whole time, even though I know what happens. And just, I didn't want to see it. Because <laughs> it's kind of like me when I watch Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings <gasps> and the spider parts come on. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. But... Anyway, so Katniss takes out her big scary knife that she got from, I think it was from Clove, because she's the one that's kind of really knife happy. Uh, Clove is the female from District 2. And uh, she works on sawing off the branch that the nest is on. While they are sedated from the smoke from the fire. Yeah, because they're still a little sluggish. They don't stay sluggish. And she gets stung, I think, three times. Yeah. Or something like that. But... Sure. Yeah. But she sends the nest down, and thankfully most of the tracker jackers kind of latch on to the careers and to PETA down there, uh, so they don't follow her, or they don't see her as the aggressor, so that she's not um, the one that they latch on to. But you want to talk about another really, really horrible way to die... How about the way the way that the way that Glimmer died? That's the the girl from District One. Is she was just covered in these things and uh, God. Yeah. We could just retitle this book. How many ways are really unpleasant to die? You for real? <laughs> Burning to death, bad way to die. Smoke inhalation, bad way to die. Dehydration, bad way to die. <laughs> I mean... Well, is there really a good way to die? I mean... Yes, quietly in your sleep. Not many of the after, people... After the living a very long, happy life. People in the arena are not going to have that kind of option. Well, no. But <laughs> anyway, so the the plan works, and Katniss is able to get out of the tree, but she's already starting to have the hallucinations, and they're horrifying. And I can't even... I can't even describe all of them because I don't remember, but like a lot of it, she see, thinks she sees PETA come and tell her to run and to take on one of the careers that was trying to follow her. But she's not sure whether that really happened because she was also, I think, like attacked by ants and there were these bright orange bubbles or something. I don't know. Everything was really And PETA shiny. was sparkling and uh, she got the bow and arrow from Glimmer. Yeah. And Glimmer was apparently disintegrating <laughs> and oozing green stuff when pa when Katniss was trying to take the bow from her. Yeah, I mean it was it was just it was really bad, and <laughs> she she makes her way kind of away from the tree in that area, but then just loses consciousness. Yeah. Ugh. I hate that part. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Even talking about it, I'm starting to feel a little woozy. Okay, moving on. Um, what does it come up to next? That's when, uh, did Haymitch send her the ointment before the Tracker Jackers or after? I want to think it was just before while she was in the tree. Yeah, was I think that, it was. Or was that in the movie? I can't remember. I think it was in the book, too. Okay. Because I think it was, at, cause it was after she woke up, she decided to try the ointment on the Tracker Jacker stings and it didn't do anything. Okay. But yeah, he he she gets her first sponsor gift, which is a little pot of ointment for her burns. Which that was nice of them. Yeah. You know, let's keep her alive a little longer. And uh 
she she gets with Rue again. She runs into Rue again. Yeah. And Rue is the one that gives her the remedy for the tracker jacker stings. Yeah, it's this type of leaf that she found that apparently grows in in the arena. And can I just say that sounds an awful lot like the old wives tale remedy for bee stings down here. <laughs> well, that would make sense, you know. Which is tobacco. Uh-huh. Chewed tobacco. Put it on, apparently if you put that on stings, it helps. I would never let anybody put that on my stings because I think it's kind of gross, but. Well, if it's the only thing that you have, then I guess you try it. My granny swore by it. Well, maybe it works. I don't know. I've never tried it. I mean, it was one of these things where it was like, okay, granny had arthritis in her hands. Well, apparently a remedy for arthritis is let a bee sting you. Okay, I've never heard that one. Yeah, you, you try to let them sting it, because, I mean, her hand, she had knots, like, on her knuckles and her wrist from arthritis. You try to get the bee to sting you right in the knot, and it's supposed to make you your arthritis better. Well, then you had to put the chewing tobacco on the bee sting, because the bee sting hurt. And I'm just like... Well, how do you how do you talk the bees into stinging you right where you need them? <laughs> I don't know. That's the part that never made sense to me. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, you know, apparently primitive medicine was crazy. Well, but some of it worked. And uh, the, whatever Rue gave Katniss, it did work because the stings yeah. were a lot better. The swelling had gone down. She doesn't have as much pain. And so they team up, which I loved. And they decide that this, this is where they decide that the careers are at a disadvantage because they don't know how to be hungry. Right, and both of them do, because, you know, they live in districts where they don't have a lot. Right, and so Katniss and Rue decide that the careers have all of the stuff that was left in the cornucopia all stacked up down by the lake, and so they decide that they're going to go and destroy it, and then the careers would have to try and hunt and try to live off the land, and Cadmus doesn't think that they'll be able to do it, or not very well. Well, you know, I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. You know, they're trained for fighting and things, but they're not really trained for survival. And even when the, in the training center, they were quick to go and work with all of the weapons, but they didn't really do much with, like, how to build traps to catch animals or any of that sort of thing. Right. So, they they didn't really see that as important because typically they were strong enough that they could take whatever they wanted and didn't have to worry about it. So, no, I think that, that Katniss and Rue are, are right on the money on this one because once you take that advantage away from them, then that gives an advantage to the people that came from poorer districts because now they have a way to take care of themselves where the careers wouldn't. Right. They're used to fending for themselves like that. They're used to dealing with the hunger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have a better chance of surviving than the careers do once their supplies are gone. So they set up this plan where they're going to light uh, big bonfires so that the smoke will kind of lead the the careers away from their campsite, which works. And Katniss sees that they have all the supplies stacked up in a big pyramid. And the earth is all dug up around the pyramid, and she's trying to figure out what they did because she's sure, because they left it alone. So she's sure that they've booby-trapped it somehow. She just, well, even Rue said that there was there was something not quite right about the way they were acting and the way they had it set up. Well, for one thing, they had brought in one of the people from District 3, and he wasn't one of the people that they normally would have gravitated towards. He was kind of small and kind of weak, and usually it was all of the big tough guys he that... Had, he had a bad foot or something, didn't he? Was that the one with the bad foot? I can't remember. Yeah, I believe it was. But you find out that the reason that they had him was because District 3 is responsible for... Uh, like mechanical things, electronic things, and what they had done was they dug up the mines that were around the podiums where the tributes first entered the arena, 
and mm -hmm. put them in and around where the food was so that you can't step on the ground or you'll be blown sky high. Which leads me to wonder how they were able to get their own supplies off without well, being I'm very sure careful. They had they had a specific path because remember it said uh, when she saw Foxface run in that she was very careful about where she stepped that she followed a specific pattern. Right. So she had apparently watched them go in and out. They knew exactly where to step and she just mimicked the pattern that they made. So I mean if you didn't know where to step then you were going to get blown sky high. Right. But it's actually a really ingenious plan and uh, you find out, I think you find out in later books or when they're talking about it that the game makers were actually quite impressed because that was something they hadn't seen before. Yeah. Uh, but they they have all this stuff stacked up, and I love that they fig she figures out a way to basically shoot her arrows at a bag of apples so that mm -hmm. the bag of apples will fall and like tumble down and set off the mines, which will end up sending a chain reaction through the the pile, and destroys everything. Including her left ear, but, you know, hey, whatever. Yes. Yeah. She, she can, she's kind of blown backwards and uh, loses the hearing in her left ear. I think it was the left ear. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, she got a little bit more of an explosion than she bargained for. Yeah. But it, it did what it needed to do, and she was able to get back undercover before the, the careers came back, and before Cato, which is the big tribute from District 2, decided that, you know, District 3's plan didn't work and just very casually snaps his neck. Yeah. <sighs> and has a complete hissy fit. Yeah, like pounding the ground and everything else. Because they don't know what to do now. Which, you know, I think is actually rather amusing. Too bad, so sad. Yeah. But, anyway, Katniss very slowly recovers. Now, this is something that they did leave out of the movie, the fact that she lost her hearing. Yeah. But that might have been just because it would be hard to portray. Yeah. True. It would be hard to, uh... To, to really make that show. Visual. I mean, even eventually in the... In the book, she stopped mentioning it. Just because, I guess, she started getting used to it. So, it would just... It would, it would have been hard. And it... I mean, it was a point, but it wasn't... A major point. So, uh, uh, especially since they fixed it at the end. Yeah. So. I mean, if it had been something that she would have had to have lived with throughout the other two, then yeah, they probably should have left it in there. But yeah. But since they a, fixed it at the end, then it's really not that big of a deal. Right. But anyway, uh, Katniss goes to look for Rue, but Rue isn't where they were supposed to meet. And. Katniss tries looking for her. They had they had agreed to use the mocking birds to pass along a signal because mocking jays will kind of mimic the sounds of voices and yeah. they had like a little four note melody that they were supposed to try and use to let each other know that they were safe. And so Katniss tries that, she doesn't get an answer. She finds Rue stuck in a net. And then finds one, was it one of the careers that ran up with a spear? Yeah, I think so. And uh, Katniss is able to get Rue out of the net, but the career throws a spear and it, you know, ends up in Rue. And it's one of the saddest parts in the whole book. It really oh, is. Oh, God. It's just... It's, it's one of the scenes that really shows just the atrocities that are being committed here because Rue was such a sweet and simple little girl. And there was no reason for her to have gone through any of this. She didn't deserve it. I mean, even the events that led up to the Hunger Games, she didn't have anything to do with it. No. And it was, it was so senseless. And Katniss kind of wanted to leave some sort of tribute for her and even though they they do collect the bodies as they're as the games go by she basically covers rue in wildflowers 
as a way to say goodbye to her. And it was it was just so so sad. Which, you know, it ends up saving Katniss's life later. Yeah. Because uh District eleven decides to send Katniss the bread. I guess that they were they might have been saving that to send to Rue. But since they couldn't send it to Rue, they sent it to Katniss instead. Well, actually, I meant it saved her life because when she had the encounter at the feast with oh, the other... Oh, that's true. So it saved her a couple times. From District 11, he was like, you know, you you put the flowers around her, you protected her, you know, so I'm going to let you go. Right. And not bash your skull in. Yeah, he's a scary dude. But, oh, oh this is going to be a long episode. Yay. Um. Anyway... So, there's an announcement saying that they've decided to make a, a rule change that two victors can be declared if both winners are from the same district. Well, immediately, Wait. Katniss is like, we could both go home. Yeah. Okay. Which, it's just a, a ploy from the game makers to make things more entertaining again. Yeah. Well, and two, because they do show in the movie, and I'm guessing that this probably happened in the book too, but we weren't there to see it. Uh, you had Hamish that was going around kind of spreading this story about the two of them being in love and having to fight against each other. And so probably, I mean, the people in the capital were kind of suckers for that kind of melodrama. So they probably were the, the attitude in the capital was kind of like, oh gosh, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be amazing if they could both win and then they could be together and it would just be this like wonderful happy ending to this horrible brutal bloody violent thing. But and as I'm guessing there was a lot of that kind of thing going on in the background. Yeah. When they decided to try this, but then uh, Katniss immediately goes looking for Peta and she can't find him, but she does. She, she gets to, to a point where she's looking for him and she sees, like, a, a trail of blood. Because she knows that he was injured because he went... Number one, he was stung with the Tracker Jackers, and number two, he was fighting Kato. Yeah, they injured his leg. Yeah, pretty bad, too. But he's hiding down by this little river. And he's in a pretty bad way. He can't walk hardly at all. But they find they find this little cave... And that becomes their home for a couple days. And Peter just keeps getting worse and worse. And they, they realize that his, the, the cut on his leg is getting infected and he has blood poisoning. Which, that sounds pleasant. Again, not a very pleasant way to die. No, it doesn't sound like it because he has a fever and he's very uncomfortable and a lot of pain. And so... They kind of, while they're in this cave, they kind of have time to talk a little bit more about, I don't even want to say their relationship, because it's it's not that yet, but just how they feel about one another. And when they announce the feast, they say that each one of you needs something very badly. And so at sunrise... We're going to, you have to report to the cornucopia, and it'll be there on for you to get. And you don't have any choice, you have to go. <laughs> well, actually, I don't, I don't know necessarily that you don't have a choice. I mean, you could probably ignore it, but it's something that everybody needs. And Katniss immediately knows that it's going to be some kind of medicine to save PETA. But PETA begs her not to go, he doesn't want her to risk life for him he wants her to stay because one of the reasons they do these feasts is to make the tributes if they're hiding and avoiding each other to make them have to come together so that they have to fight they're very good at doing this yes well they've had lots of practice that's true they've had 74 years worth of doing this but anyway so they she gets another gift from Haymitch oh yes that's true she does and it's a bowl of of broth to give. No, she's already got that. It's after they announce the feast that she gets the sleep syrup. Oh, that's right. But it, it, she gets the broth right before that. and she gets the broth after she kisses him. Yeah, and so she's 
kind of thinking, okay, we still have to play this with cameras, so one kiss equals one thing of broth. Okay. This is so twisted and wrong. But yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you, uh, she ends up promising Peter that she wouldn't go, but then ends up sneaking him this this sleep syrup that, you know, obviously, like it says, it makes him fall asleep. And so she goes and watches as this table appears and it has these backpacks with numbers on it. And the one for 12 is this tiny little package. And the first person she sees, like, as soon as it appears is Foxface. And she's from District 5, I think. Yeah, I think so. And basically she's survived. She's the one that stole from the, the careers. And basically she was surviving by, by stealing, for lack of a better word, from other other groups and kind of staying hidden but following along and kind of never taking too much so that they would notice something was gone, but kind of scavenging. Yeah. And so she runs out there, grabs hers, and takes off. So Katniss is looking around. You don't see any of the other ones there. So Well, she hid in the cornucopia. Oh, Foxface did? Yeah. Okay. Because Katniss was like, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I come last night and hide in the cornucopia? Good idea. <laughs> but, so Katniss runs out there, and she's immediately attacked by Clove, who is a real sadistic piece of work. And she's, like, she ends up cutting Katniss in the forehead, and they tussle and fight, and Clove eventually, like, pins her down and is going to just basically carve her face up. I mean, she's just this really violent person. And let me tell you, the girl who played her in the movie is creepy. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. But that's when the other tribute from District 11 steps in. Yes. His name is Thresh, and he's this humongous dude. I mean, he's a really big guy. And uh, he basically lifts the District 2 girl off of Katniss and is saying, did you kill the little girl? What did, did Were you the one that, that, that killed the little girl? Because Clove was kind of using Rue's death to taunt Katniss a little bit. And that didn't sit too well with Thresh. Mm-mm. So, yeah, eventually he bashes her head in with a rock. And he turns to Katniss, and Katniss is like, oh, crap. Uh, this isn't going to end well. But he decides that uh, because of the way Katniss took care of Rue, that just for this just this one time, he's going to spare her. Yeah. And then he it's takes okay. off. And then he takes off with with not only his backpack but also District Two's. <laughs> yep. Just because. And sorry, Kato, if you needed something in there, but it's too bad. But too bad, sad. You can't have it. Oh, sorry. But uh, well, the other thing too is that District Two is the only district left that has two surviving members, so they're also working as a team because they could both go home. Right. So, uh, not anymore, but they could have. And, uh, so Katniss gets back and uses the medicine and Peter starts to get better, although he's none too happy with the fact that she drugged him and ran off, which, okay, he kind of has a point. Um, but it worked, so what can you do? Anyway, so he starts to get better and they start trying to figure out what to do next. And is this when the mutts come out? Because, oof. Oh, the mutts. Um, we're, we're close to the mutts. It's pretty soon oh. after this. Well, there's the thing with the berries. Yeah, where when th- Fox Face does. Right, because they were looking for food, and uh, Peta finds all of these berries, and when Katniss sees what he was gathering, she freaks out because they're poisonous. And that's when they find out that Foxface had been following them, had been stealing berries, and then she ends up dying. (laughs) And I did like the fact that they decided to keep the berries, and they thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe Kato likes berries. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that would be an easy way to get rid of them, you know, maybe. That was kind of funny. Maybe Maybe we can feed them to him. Yeah. 
But then at some point they, I can't remember when, but at some point they hear a cannon because we didn't mention there's a cannon blast every time one of the tributes dies. But they hear one and they assume that that was Cato and Thresh fighting and one of them has died. Which means now it's just, oh, well they see, no, they see the images in the sky too, so they know that it's Thresh who's died. <clears throat> so now they also know that it's just the two of them and Cato who are left. And that's when the mutts come in. Yeah, they go back to the cornucopia. Yeah, they, they start heading back towards the cornucopia because they figure at some point this has to end. And the game makers probably want it to end soon because now that there's so few people, they just want it to be over and announce a victor and everything else. So they start heading back that way and they end up being chased by... There's, there's several different creatures that the capital has genetically engineered, and one was the Tracker Jackers, and they have a couple of others. Um, but, Jabber Jays. Yeah, the Jabber Jays, and um, by accident the Mocking Jays, too. But uh, they call them mutations, like a cross between mutations and the word mutt, because usually it's some kind of crossbreed. But they created these large dog-looking creatures that look just like the dead tributes. Which, ew. See, and it just, as it, 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 vile as these people are, it would not surprise me if that's what they did with the dead tributes' bodies. Yeah. Is turn them into these things. Yeah. But, anyway, so they're chased all the way to the cornucopia by these things, and they get there... And they climb on top of the cornucopia after almost falling and almost landing in there. And that's when they realize that, you know, I'm looking at this this creature and it basically has Glimmer's eyes and looks very similar to her except on a big, you know, rabid looking dog. <clears throat> Which they didn't do that part in the movie. You had the big rabid dog, but you didn't. they didn't cross them with the tributes in any way. But... Cato ends up too, there too, and he has some sort of body armor of some sort. And so he gets up on the thing, and I think Katniss tries to shoot him, but the arrow bounces off, so that's when they realize that he's wearing something stronger. And then you, you, find, you have the final showdown on top of the cornucopia. And Cato grabs hold of Peta and basically puts him in a headlock and threatens to break his neck. And Katniss is holding them by arrow point, basically. And it, it's this, this stalemate, because if she shoots Cato and he falls, there's a good chance that Peter's going to go with him and they're going to get eaten by... They're both going to get eaten by the mutts. Yeah. But she can't just stand there and do nothing, because then Peter's going to die anyway. But Peter basically because he's bleeding somewhere who knows where but he draws an x on Cato's hand and that's where Katniss shoots which makes Cato let go and then he falls and then this part was one of the most disturbing things in the book and that's saying something in this book yeah it really is when Cato falls and he falls into the the pack of mutts and you expect him to die quickly but he doesn't yeah. I mean, he they're, they're having a hard time getting to a lot of him because he's got this armor, but, I mean, he's basically being mauled to death, and it takes a really long time. And you can hear him. Yeah, it's very gruesome. Yeah, it, incredibly so. And finally, Katniss decides to end it and shoots an arrow through the pack into him to put him out of his misery, basically, at that point. And that's when you realize that only the victors from District 12 are left. And you think, ending it. And for a second, you feel relief because you're like, okay, everything that they've been through, it's been awful, but now they get to go home and everything's wonderful again. Except no. there's another announcement saying, oh, yeah, guess what? You know that rule where we decided we were going to let two people go? Yeah, we've decided that that doesn't really work. So we can only have one victor. Uh, good luck. And that's about when your heart stops. <laughs> And that's when I realized that they never intended to let two of them go home anyway. No. And it's it's so tragic because 
they've grown close at this point. And I mean, obviously PETA cares for her and always has, but Katniss was starting to have, I mean, not necessarily to fall in love with him, but to care about him quite a bit. Yeah. And he, and he's flat out saying, go ahead and do it. You have to go home and take care of your family. My family is okay. And she's like, I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> and it leads to a very genius plan when yep. she decides that, you know, if they're going to do this, then we're not going to let them have a victor. And we're going to eat the poisonous berries at the same time. And we're both going to die and it's going to ruin the games. And that's yeah, going to be how, that yeah. And so that's how we're going to get back at them. How messed up is that? It, it yeah. <laughs> so it, either of us or both of us. Yeah. So they decide that that's what they're going to do. And so they each have berries and they get ready to eat them and they like, you know, count to three on one. And then you hear the very, the very panicked sound of one of the game makers saying, okay, stop. You both win. Yay. And Katniss has just pissed off the Capitol. Pretty much. Um, they're none too pleased with the way, I mean, well, the citizens of the Capitol thought that it was a wonderful story and that it was very entertaining or whatever. The president of Pan Am, President Snow, not real pleased. Because she basically turned the tables on them. She outsmarted them and made them look foolish. And we can't have that. We can't have that. And there because were... Because they never look foolish. No. And so this one little act, and it was completely unscripted and it was completely spontaneous, but it was also an act of rebellion because she decided at that moment that I'm not going to do what they want. They want me to, they want one of us to kill each other. And we refuse yeah. to let that happen. So we are going to purposely destroy what they've planned here. And that little tiny thing is what starts, as they say, what starts the spark, which starts to grow into a fire that is the rebellion. Which is, you know, in the next book yeah. called Catching Fire. And that's why all of the, you know, movie two slogans talks about the spark. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine having to live in a world where the government requires you to send your 12 to 18 year old children as tributes to kill each other. Oh, I know. It's terrible. It's, it's, it's horrifying. I mean, it's just, I was... Like I said, when I read these the first time, I was just like, and these are young adult children are reading these? Yeah, it, it doesn't read young adult at all. This is one of those young adult novels that is only categorized that way, I believe, because of the age of the protagonists. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree, because the subject matter is not really young adult subject matter. Well, I don't even know if that's the case. I, I think that for the most part, teenagers would be able to handle it. And I think that they would appreciate the more complex themes, but they are very violent. I mean, I was surprised that they were able to make it into a PG 13 movie. Yeah. Really? I'm surprised and after reading, finishing mocking Jay, I don't know how they're going to do that one. Yeah. That's and it true. would, and it would have to, and it has to be PG 13 because otherwise they're going to alienate a lot of their audience. Yeah. I and mean, you can't make them rated R. No, I mean, because then all of the, the 13, 14, 15-year-olds that read the books are going to be like, hey, yeah, how dare you? Well, even like older high school kids, because there, there are some high schools that use this book as teaching True. material. So, you know, it's, I don't know how they're going to do it, but since they did such a good job with, with the first one, I am very hopeful. Yeah, that they'll do a good job with the other ones, but man, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it is. some of the stuff in this one was absolutely brutal, and yeah. But anyway, in case anybody couldn't tell, we really liked these books. Yes, and we'll just we'll just add the rest of the series in there too. We liked all of them. Yeah, they're all really really good 
very difficult to put down. Once you start reading them, you can't stop. Unless you don't own them and you have to stop. Yeah. But. Which is my problem. <laughs> so if you haven't read Hunger Games, we highly recommend that you do. And after you read it, go ahead and go see the movie because it was very well done in case you couldn't tell. Yes. We, we were very we, impressed. We both we're very recommend picky. it. We're very picky about our book to movie adaptations, as you will find out when we discuss the Mortal Instruments. Yeah. So uh, we were impressed by this one. This one was very good. So anyway, uh, we do have a forum post over at the Malorian Tavern uh, talking about the Hunger Games. And we're talking, we're kind of splitting between talking about the book and the movie. So we'll have a link to that post in the show notes for this episode. And again, be sure to join us next week when we talk about the mortal instruments, because who boy, do we have a lot to say about that one. Yeah. And, oh, and we have another announcement. Oh, go ahead. We now have a cafe press store. <gasps> yes, we do. This is exciting. We have merchandise. Yes. You can get t-shirts, coffee mugs, uh, can koozies, coasters, um, there's a clock, uh, a tote bag, messenger bag, there's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And we have t-shirts that just have the Bibliophiles Anonymous logo on front, and we also have t-shirts that have the Bibliophiles Anonymous logo on front and have 10 signs you might be a Bibliophile on the back. And those are really cool. Yeah, I just made those up, but, uh. Spoiler alert, number one is you listen to the Bibliophiles Anonymous podcast. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, definitely check those out. I'll put a link to our Cafe Press store. Uh, I'll get a link up on our, just on our website in general, but we'll put a link in the show notes for this episode as well. And so definitely check that stuff out because it's really cool. I need to go ahead and place my order because I have not done that yet, although my mother has. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she did. She's like, I already placed my order. She ordered uh, coasters. Yeah, she said so. <laughs> so definitely check that out. Uh, it's really cool stuff, and it's Cafe Press, and y'all know how good they are. So uh, they, they sell a lot of different things, so you can take your pick. And, uh, yeah, and if there's anything that you would like to see that's not in our store, let us know because I can add it. Yeah, so anything you'd like to have to spread the word about the podcast, we would love for you to do it. So... Uh, be sure to check that out and to join us next week. If you have seen The Mortal Instruments and have any opinions about what you think about the movie, whether it's about casting, whether it's about plot points, whether it's about anything, uh, please send us an email and we want to try and read some of them on the show next week because I know Jess and I had some really strong opinions about it, but we want to see if some other people maybe saw it a little bit differently. Uh, our opinions are very similar to one another, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm going to see it again Wednesday. Yeah, so. I don't know when I'm going to have a chance to see it again. I want to see it again at some point, but I'm not sure when. But anyway, email us uh, at bibliophiles.podcast at gmail.com. You can also tweet us at bibanonpodcast or uh, leave us comments on our official website, which is www. Or post the at the tavern. Do we have a Mortal Instruments thread at the tavern yet? I started one yesterday. Okay. Okay. Well, then there's another place you can do it. Um, but you can also always leave us comments on our official website, uh, bibliophiles-anonymous.com. So be sure to join us next week. I think that episode is going to be a lot of fun because you love when we go crazy about stuff, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so anyway. Huh? And as long as we're having fun, who cares? Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, be sure to join us for next week. But until then, thank you so much for listening. And we will see you again then. Bye. <laughs> Bye.